talking about digital well-being and he is a PhD student at the University of Washington. So welcome and the floor is yours. All right, so hello Clue Seminar. Uh, it's an honor to speak with you today and thank you to Audrey and Tamara for setting up this presentation. Um, I wish I could be with you all in Ottawa, but uh, instead today I'm calling in from Seattle where I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington. And today I'll be presenting my research on digital well-being. So when my father was in graduate school, computers were expensive, huge, and he had to schedule time to use one from 3 to 5 a.m. because that was the only time when it wasn't being used by more senior researchers. So today, most people in developed countries have constant access to a smartphone in their pocket that is far more powerful than any mainframe computer. And this has incredible benefits for our lives in terms of work, leisure, and connecting with friends and family. Um, and of course, this is even more so the case in the midst of a global pandemic, when many of our in-person ways of doing things are no longer safe. But this constant access can also have some drawbacks. So for example, when people use a computer today at 3 to 5 AM, it looks more like this, or at least it does in my case. Um, <clears throat> and some of the issues that arise from this uh, digital media overuse include loss of sleep, loss of productivity, and diminished social relationships. So one recent study actually asked participants about the temptations that they experienced throughout the day and how often they were able to resist each of these temptations. So these temptations included sleep, sex, eating, drinking, and socializing, and the failure rate ranged from 20 to 60%. But there was another temptation was still a greater failure rate. Um, and that was media use. Um, and of course, today, most media use is in the form of digital media, like social media and online videos. Um, and participants failed to resist the temptation of digital media use in 75% of cases throughout their daily lives. So we should recognize that this is not by accident. Uh, a lot of these apps and services are uh, monetized by capturing attention. So they are designed for attention capture. Um, and sometimes this even goes so far as to constitute what we might call a dark pattern where uh, the designer really exploits psychological vulnerabilities on the part of the user uh, for their own interests or benefit. So in this example, you'll see that there's um, a smartphone screen and there's actually what looks like a thin black line but it's supposed to be like a hair. Um, so the user perceives it as a hair and then tries to tap to get, wipe this hair off of their screen and inadvertently gets to go to this uh, Black Friday sale instead. Um, and this is just one example of a technique that's kind of an extreme one, but an example of how sometimes technologies can be purposefully designed to capture an attention that weighs in ways that uh, go against the user's best interest. Uh, and so today I wanna to talk to you about three points. Um, the first is how might we define digital well-being? <clears throat> the second is how might we understand what supports or undermines digital well-being? And third, how can we design for digital well-being? And before we dive in, I also want to share a few words about myself. Um, so in my work, I use human-centered methods to research and design technologies for digital well-being. So that means I like to start my research with an investigation of the users, of the stakeholders who are involved in a particular technology, um, and then brainstorm, prototype, and iterate on different designs of that technology, and finally evaluate it with real users in the field. So the designs and technologies um, that I present to users need to be usable, but they're not necessarily intended to reach a mass audience. Instead, um, we take what's called a research through design approach. Um, and the purpose of our designs then is to tell us something about 
how that technology does or does not fit into our social world. Um, and finally, as background about myself, I also worked in China as a product manager at a venture-backed mobile internet startup for six years. So I will also draw upon those skills that I developed in that work in my own research. <clears throat> so let's turn to the first item on the agenda. How is digital well-being defined in academia and in industry? So in 2019, I co-organized a workshop on digital well-being in Glasgow, Scotland for the CHI conference, which is a leading conference in the field of human computer interaction. Um, and we assembled 32 experts from industry and academia to discuss digital well-being. And our first order of business was to establish a consensus definition of digital well-being. And as is often the case when you get 30 academic types together in a room, we agreed on very little. However, it was very useful in identifying the diversity of ways that people think about this concept of digital well being. So, on the one hand, some workshop participants thought about digital well being in terms of a broad definition like this one. How digital technology affects psychological well-being, education, community, health, work, environment, safety, etc. Uh, and the advantage of this definition is that it recognizes how technology now affects so many aspects of modern life. Participants with this view raised issues from how discarded devices contribute to environmental pollution to algorithms with racist outcomes. However, one of the challenges for a broad definition like this is whether digital well being can serve as a useful construct if it tries to cover so many diverse concerns. Or put another way, on this definition, which challenges for digital technology would not fall under the umbrella of digital well being? So, on the other hand, some participants thought about digital well being in terms of a more narrow definition, like this one the extent to which a person perceives their digital device use to align with their own long-term goals. And this narrow definition emphasizes how apps are often designed to capture attention for purposes that do not align with users' personal goals. And so this problem is particularly acute for services with advertising business models in which developers monetize by getting users to spend as much time uh, as possible in their app which may not be in uh, align with a user's long-term goals. Um, and while this definition leaves out important societal concerns, it has the advantage of calling attention to the specific problem of how technology often leads people towards behaviors that do not align with their own goals. Um, and this, of course, is the same problem that we saw in our earlier study, uh, that participants failed to resist the temptation to consume digital media in over 75% of cases throughout their daily lives. Um, and another way of looking at this is in terms of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's framework of well, uh, well-being. And so the OECD framework is used to measure well-being at a population level, includes a wide range of quality of life measures and material conditions, such as income and wealth, environment quality, and safety. Um, so all of these measures taken together generally align with the broad definition of digital well-being, whereas what we might call the narrow definition um, aligns mostly just with this one of subjective well-being or how people perceive themselves to be doing. So ultimately, should we think of digital well-being in terms of this broad definition or the narrow one? Um, I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, both of these definitions have merit. However, it is really important that when you talk to people about digital well being, it is clear what is actually meant by that term. And so, in my own work, I've focused mostly on this narrow definition of digital well being and looked at how technology can be designed to support or undermine users in achieving their own long term goals. Um, and this also happens to be the definition of digital well being that I would say most closely aligns with how major tech companies have applied uh, the concept. So Google on its digital well-being site, for example, explains, we believe technology should improve life, not distract from it. And in response to digital well-being concerns, 
the first step that many major tech companies have taken is to release screen time tools. So these act like a dashboard that lets users monitor how much time they spend in different apps, uh, and sometimes also set limits on that time. So features like this now exist in Google's Android, Apple's iOS, Facebook, um, Instagram, and YouTube. So my research, I wanted to understand how well do screen time tracking tools really help users bring the time that they spend on technology in line with their goals for use. So that brings us to the second point in the agenda um, around understanding digital well-being. So in short, when do people feel that their technology use aligns with their personal goals? And I want to share two studies of mine on this topic. The first study is really about how people derive a sense of meaning or, or meaningfulness from their technology use. And the se second study is on how people derive a sense of agency or control over their technology use. So uh, to better understand digital well-being, we started off with the uh, intriguing premise that digital technologies often excel at providing short-term pleasure. Um, and of course, there's nothing wrong with pleasure. Uh, the problem is just that it sometimes can seriously interfere with people's long-term goals or can be designed to do so. Um, so playing Farmville to connect with friends after work is one thing, but playing Farmville to procrastinate on a term paper is another. Um, and we wanted to understand how can technology contribute to long-term well-being? So we turned to the Greek philosopher Aristotle who believed that people should strive to live life with a sense of fulfillment and meaning. And to him, that meant pursuing goals that might be effortful or even unpleasant in the short term, but meaningful in the long term. So for example, that might even include raising children or making an effort to appreciate poetry, poetry uh, as it promises joy in the long run. So our first study to understand digital well-being asked, what makes smartphone use meaningful or meaningless? Uh, and this was work that we published in 2018 in uh, the journal IMWAT, which is associated with the Conference on Ubiquitous Computing. Um, and I actually wanted to engage you as audience members for this portion and ask you to share in the Zoom chat um, just one example of what is a way that you use your phone that feels meaningful. So I'll give you uh, maybe a uh, 30 seconds or so here to share a couple examples in the chat, and then we'll see how your responses may align with what we found in our own research. Nice, so I see a lot of responses about talking to family, connecting with people, especially during COVID. And I uh, very much second those um, from personal experience as well. Um, organization of multiple calendars, browsing photos, Twitter. So we have a wide range of different responses here. Um, Let's turn to this question now. Um, what is one example of a way that you uh, use your phone that feels meaningless? Uh, this was the flip side or the other side of um, the question that we um, sought to answer in this research. So we've got YouTube, doom scrolling, scrolling Reddit, especially before bed, mindless scrolling on Twitter, a lot of mindlessness, I suppose, here. Reddit scrolling, scrolling, add in every app, scrolling through Instagram. Great, so that's, that's nice. Um, let's see how that aligns with some of the um, findings that we had in our own research when we asked these questions. So the way that we approached this was to um, study, run a study with 45 Android smartphone users. Um, in the United States, and we had a gender split of close to 50-50. Uh, 
Um, the median age of our participants in the study was about 28 years old, so somewhat younger than the general US population. Um, and in the first part of the study, we used the experience sampling method. Um, so in this method, pioneered by the psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and colleagues, um, you can survey study participants at the exact time of an event of interest. So in this case, we were studying smartphone app use, and we built a smartphone app that could monitor the apps that participants used on their phone and survey them right at that time. And in total, we collected um, data for 86,000 app use sessions and 9,000 300 um, surveys over two weeks with an 86% response rate. Um, the survey questions that we asked um, popped up immediately after a user finished using an app on their phone. And the first question uh, participants answered was this one. How much do you feel like you have spent time on something meaningful? So very similar to the question that I had just asked you to answer in the chat and then participants rated that on a seven point scale from not at all meaningful to very meaningful. Um, and we wanted to understand what kinds of app use participants thought to be meaningful or not. The second part of the question um, asked participants how they were currently using their phones. So namely, uh, what best describes how you use this app just now? And we asked participants to describe their use in one of five types derived from prior literature, which were communication, social media, entertainment, information, and productivity. So the second part of our study methods was that we then also interviewed participants and uh, showed them actually the data that we had collected about how they used, um, uh, what, which apps they used and how they had rated it in terms of meaningfulness. Um, and then uh, we wanted to, get some more details on what they were experiencing in their lives at that moment um, so that we could understand why they answered the survey data the way that they did. Um, to analyze the data, we started with the interview data and coded it and did affinity diagramming to identify themes. And second, we then used the experiencing sampling uh, data to uh, confirm or disconfirm some of these themes. And what we found was that productivity was often meaningful. Um, one participant said the Slack app, that one is meaningful because it actually gives us support. It's meaningful in that way because it helps me get work done easier. Uh, and communication was another app use that was seen as meaningful most of the time. I didn't get to speak to my daughter for at least four or five days. I got my own apartment and she's mad at me because I left. Then yesterday she finally talked to me on Facebook. So that's why I put six out of seven for meaningfulness. Um, and when we asked what type of use participants found less meaningful, they overwhelmingly singled out passive social media use. Um, and one participant said, oh yeah, browsing social media, going to Facebook just to browse and not doing anything else going to Instagram just to browse, I think those are pretty much meaningless. Um, and I think that aligns with some of the responses that we received in the chat here around just scrolling through various types of social media. Um, entertainment was also experienced as being less meaningful. And so one participant shared, I wouldn't say any time spent on the app, the Deep Town game was meaningful. It's just a way to entertain myself mindlessly. Um, and one thing that stood out in quotes like this one um, was the use of the word mindlessly here and suggesting, which suggests that using um, one's device without intention uh, mindlessly really relates to having a less meaningful experience. Um, and so next we turn to our experience sampling data to confirm or disconfirm these themes. And when we look at meaningfulness on the y-axis uh, and type of use on the x-axis, uh, we can see that entertainment and social media are significantly less meaningful relative to other uses. Um, so productivity, information, and communication all averaged above a four on our seven point scale for meaningfulness, whereas entertainment and social media average below a 3.5. Um, so all of this data told us about averages, but we also did see a lot of variation in our data. Um, sometimes the same type of use 
could be meaningful um, at different times, and then sometimes it was also meaningless. So for example, one father often played the game Candy Crush on his phone, um, and most of the time he rated it very low in terms of the meaningfulness it provided him. But sometimes he actually rated it as a seven out of seven for meaningfulness. And he explained in this quote, you can't step outside for a minute each time it gets hectic because it's always hectic with three children. So again, I ended up using apps and games to uplift myself and relax. So sometimes it provided much needed relief and was therefore seen as meaningful. Um, finally, another major theme that came up over and over again is that people felt a loss of control over their smartphone use, um, which also aligns with the earlier data that I presented about um, the failure to resist certain temptations. And here one participant describes how their smartphone use has become habitual and led to some detrimental consequences. Um, so without even, even realizing it, I pulled out my phone and then started mindlessly checking my email. Then when I put it away, I realized, oh, I feel bad for ignoring my friends. Um, so some of the overall findings here were that entertainment and social media were less meaningful than communication, information, and productivity use cases. Um, however, there was a large variation in the meaningfulness rating of the same app in different situations. Uh, and finally, a loss of control led to meaningless app use. So with these findings in mind, we launched our second study to understand digital well-being, uh, which was recently accepted for publication at CHI 2021. Um, and here we wanted to understand what are the design features that lead people to feel a loss of control or loss of agency over their technology and media use. So let's start with what is sense of agency? Um, well, in everyday language, uh, sense of agency can sometimes be called sense of control. Um, a more formal definition, though, would describe it as an individual's experience of being the initiator of their actions in the world. Or put another way, am I in control of my actions and my environment? So why does sense of agency matter? So first, a low sense of control over technology use predicts greater negative life effects. Um, for example, internet use leading to missed social opportunities and smartphone use leading to um, the loss of significant relationships, jobs, or even uh, career opportunities. Um, and scales of problematic technologies that are sometimes used to diagnose digital well-being problems, if you will, um, generally measure both a lack of control and negative life impacts, suggesting that a lack of control is a significant part of what constitutes problematic technology use. And second, I would argue that sense of agency matters in its own right um, as a component of a fulfilled life. So one of the three basic needs in self-determination theory is autonomy, um, the need for control over one's actions and environment. And we saw this in our work on meaningfulness as well. Participants themselves were simply deeply frustrated at times by their inability to control their own use of smartphone apps. So in this study, we decided to focus specifically on the YouTube mobile app for three reasons. Um, first, in our study of meaningfulness, we studied smartphone use at the level of apps and general types of use like communication. Um, and in this study, we wanted to focus in on a single app to better understand how its design features, such as playlists, influence user sense of agency. Second, uh, YouTube was one of the apps that was often reported as leading to a loss of control and meaningless, meaningless experiences in our first study. Um, and of course, this was not the case for all YouTube use, but certainly for some of it. So third then, YouTube is also the most widely, social, uh, widely used social media app in the US. Uh, being used by about 75% of the population. Uh, so our first research question then was, what existing mechanisms in the YouTube mobile app influence sense of agency? So to answer this question, we conducted an online survey of YouTube users, uh, 120 of them um, in the US. And 
They average a median time of 50 minutes per day in the app, which uh, is actually slightly, just only slightly above the average for the US population. Um, and in our survey, we asked them about uh, what design features uh, really made them feel most in control of their time on YouTube. So we asked, what are three things about the YouTube mobile app that lead you to feel most in control over how you spend your time on YouTube? And <clears throat> one participant, for example, answered, I'm able to quickly access my subscribed channels. I don't spend uncontrolled amounts of time browsing through videos that may or may not be related to what I want to watch. And then we asked an analogous question for what made them feel least in control over the time that they spent on YouTube. And one participant, for example, responded, I have a hard time not looking at the suggested videos that the algorithm picks for me. I almost always justify watching just one more video. Uh, so again, I think uh, I'd love to engage the audience here and ask, um, of these nine features that were most commonly mentioned in responses, so notifications, play controls, watch history and stats, search ads, playlists, recommendations, subscriptions, and autoplay, um, which one mechanism uh, would you think made our participants feel most in control over how they spend their time in the YouTube mobile app? So just um, put your answer in the chat and we'll see how you did relative to, uh, or what your responses are relative to what participants uh, in our study said. So we have subscriptions, 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 play controls, play controls, notification bell feature, search. Yeah, it seems like subscriptions and play controls are coming up a lot. Um, so thanks for those responses. Let's go ahead and see what um, participants in our study actually said. So here's a divergent bar chart of um, how many times each of these nine design mechanisms led participants to feel more control or less control. Um, so the red bars uh, indicate responses that participants, where participants said that this feature made them feel less in control and the blue bars indicate responses where participants felt like this made them feel more in control. Um, and first of all, I think you'll notice that uh, recommendations shown in the YouTube app, mobile app are by far the most frequently mentioned design mechanism influencing whether or not users feel in control of their experience. Um, and then you'll also see that recommendations, ads, and autoplay primarily made participants feel less in control, whereas playlists, search, subscriptions, play controls, and watch history and stats primarily made respondents feel more in control. And so I think with your own responses in the chat here, um, you definitely nailed uh, at least two of those subscriptions and play controls. And then some of you mentioned some of the others as well. Um, and some of these responses though were also split where you would see, for instance, notifications here were sometimes mentioned as leading to more control and sometimes to less. Um, so what we, might we take away from this as overall findings? Um, well, one is that planning ahead supports control. So um, for example, this was supported by features like playlists. Uh, one respondent said, I can create playlists or queue videos in advance to limit what I want to watch to a specific list instead of endlessly searching around for what I want. Um, or by the watch later feature which lets uh, users save a particular later to a particular video to a playlist that lets them um, pull it up later. Um, watch later means I don't feel pressured into watching a recommended video from autoplay right when I see it. <clears throat> now, if planning ahead supported control, on the other hand, this was sometimes undermined by features like related video recommendations. And here a participant responded, I often spend more time than I meant too, because there is a good related video that seems worth watching. So, you know, just one more video, which becomes a couple of hours. 
Um, so with that, I think we can also now turn to the third agenda item, which is designing for digital well-being. Uh, and here we asked, how might we design or redesign technologies for digital well-being? And we'll actually continue with the test case of the YouTube mobile app. Um, and that's because the YouTube mobile app actually has similar mechanisms as many other social media apps, such as Infinite Scroll and Autoplay. Um, and we also had an eye towards using Google's public APIs uh, for YouTube to build a new app that can play back YouTube videos, but plays with some of these design mechanisms to make users feel more or less in control of their experience. So our second research question was, what changes to the mechanisms in the YouTube mobile app uh, might influence the sense of agency? So to do this, we conducted co-design with YouTube users. Um, and our participants were 13 US users of the YouTube mobile app. Um, and they spent a median of 52 minutes per day on YouTube. Uh, and we did two activities with them. One was a sketching activity. The second was evaluating mockups. Um, and in the sketching activity, we had them um, take a blank piece of paper that showed just a wireframe of the homepage for uh, the YouTube mobile app, and then uh, answer this question, what would you change on this page to feel uh, less in control of how you spend your time on YouTube, and then do the same exercise for changes that they would make that would make them feel more in control of their experience. Um, so you can see that this user has marked it up by adding uh, tons of recommendations plastered all over the home screen for the lesson control experience. Um, and then by contrast, um, made the search bar more prominent in the more in control version um, and made the recommendations more personally targeted in terms of um, content that the user has already indicated that they would like to watch. Um, and the second component of the co-design activity was that we actually created some mockups of different ways that the design mechanisms in the YouTube app might be uh, redesigned <clears throat> based on our findings from uh, the first part of the study. Um, and so here, for example, are three different versions, a low control version, a medium control version, and a high control version of the recommendations feature. Um, and then the first one, the YouTube mobile app would show unlimited recommendations in the medium control version, which um, show three recommendations as you scroll down. And then you'd have to click, click to show more recommendations if you would like. Um, and in the high control version, um, it would show no recommendations um, and instead be driven by user search. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of our overall findings um, from these exercises, one of the ones that stood out was that the recommendations were sometimes too interesting or too tempting, if you will. Um, and one user here described um, using the not interested feature, um, despite the fact that the, the video that he was shown was very interesting, um, but said, when I'm tempted, but no, a video is not educational, I can hide it. Um, and I think what this illustrates is that on the one hand, there's kind of a local optimization problem um, that YouTube and its algorithms have made a ton of progress on. And uh, that local optimization problem is out of millions of videos, which one is the user most likely to watch? And so that makes these recommendations extremely compelling, interesting, or tempting at times. But on the other hand, it really misses out on a more global optimization problem, which is out of many possible actions, which one does the user most want to take? Um, so in cases like this, it's clear that recommendations appeal to a user's impulse or short-term desire to watch more videos, but conflicted with their long-term goals um, and created a self-control dilemma for the user. Um, and to be clear, I don't think this means that Google or others should try to create an algorithm for life that recommends between watching another video and writing a term paper or going to sleep. But it does suggest that recommender systems could first start with the global problem of whether or not to show recommendations at all, 
before moving on to the local problem of which items to recommend. Um, and some of the design solutions to this problem might be um, first deciding whether or not to show recommendations at all. <clears throat> um, and this might be informed by the time of day. Um, so 2 a.m. might be too late. Um, it might be informed by screen time preferences. So uh, when the user has already exceeded their goal of 30 minutes per day on the app, or even by uh, explicit user preferences. So asking the user to set preferences for recommendation topics that they would like to see um, and getting user feedback on recommendations, which is currently uh, only really possible through that rather unwieldy, not interested um, uh, option, which doesn't really accurately crack, capture what the user is trying to say. Um, another overall finding was that users actually wanted more control when they were using the YouTube mobile app for a specific purpose. So some examples of this were uh, when the user wanted to see basketball game highlights or a video on how to solve a Rubik's cube. Um, in these cases, they preferred mechanisms like search and being able to hide recommendations. Um, here, a user said, uh, if I have a specific goal, I know what I want. I don't need recommendations to guide my search. I just want to be in control of my search. On the other hand, there were definitely times when users had no specific purpose in mind and they just wanted to kill time uh, or to browse and explore. And so in these cases, they preferred design mechanisms more like recommendations or autoplay. Uh, they wanted to be able to lean back and let YouTube take control. Uh, one participant said, if I just want to watch something that gets my mind off things, I prefer the one where I can choose to show more recommendations. So the next step in this research project um, that we're currently working on is to build and test a redesigned version of the YouTube mobile client. Um, and we'll actually have three different versions that we'll compare against each other. Um, one will be designed for low control. So that might have this endless uh, scroll of infinite scroll of recommendations. Um, at the other extreme would be a version for high control where the user would have to proactively indicate that they want certain uh, video feeds and recommendations on their home screen. Um, and then in the middle, um, we were intrigued by this finding that there were some times when users wanted uh, more control when they had a specific uh, intention in mind or purpose in mind, and that there were some times when users wanted actually to give control over to YouTube when they had no specific purpose in mind. And so we designed a version where users can um, toggle between two different modes of using YouTube um, to be able to satisfy that um, use case. Um, so in response to digital well-being concerns, um, the first step that many major tech companies have taken was to release the screen time tools, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I hope now, after um, reviewing the research that we've done on this topic so far, you'll see that that's really not quite enough um, in terms of addressing digital well-being, um, because reducing screen time is often a pure, uh, poor proxy for what users actually want. Um, and we explored some alternatives, um, such as designing to support for more meaningful experiences and designing for a sense of agency or control. So to recap, um, we covered how digital well-being is defined in academia and in industry. We um, developed some understanding of digital well being in terms of what it means to have meaningful experiences or meaningless experiences with technology and smartphone use. Um, and finally, we looked at uh, how technology can be designed to support a sense of agency or control. Um, and we did this um, also in the context of designing for digital well being um, with the YouTube mobile app. Um, and finally, I want to thank my many collaborators on this work, without whom it would not have been possible, as well as some of the sponsors for this work, um, such as the National Science Foundation for the YouTube Study and NSERC for allowing me to present today uh, to the CLUE seminar. Um, so thank you for listening. 